Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about writing about learning and attitudinal results. Now, if you've studied the paper outline, you know that the results section must include, in addition to your usability findings, details about two other main topics, your learning effectiveness results and your attitudinal results. These parts of the results section of your paper should summarize the results of your data analysis work. And as a little bit of a refresher, you should separate your learning results from your attitudinal results. Your learning results will talk about what participants learned from your instruction and what they did not learn. The data sources that will give you those results will include your pre-tests, embedded tests if you had any, and of course your post-tests. On the other hand, your attitudinal results will address what participants liked about your instruction and what they disliked. The data sources that will give you those results will include any post-instruction questionnaires and or retrospective surveys. Now, just like when you wrote about your usability results, these two new sections of your paper should report only the facts. You don't need to do any interpretation or reflect on why you got the results you got. The goal is to simply tell the reader in a matter-of-fact way, this is what my participants learned and this is what they did not learn, and this is what they liked and this is what they did not like. It should be no surprise that writing about learning and attitudinal data is pretty similar to writing about usability data. So we want to encourage you to revisit the slides and video from week four, which provided 20 tips on writing about usability results. The vast majority of those tips and tricks will apply to writing about learning and attitudinal results as well. Now, there may be times when you want to slice your learning or attitudinal data to compare the results of different subgroups of your participants. However, we want you to be judicious in doing this. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Here's an interesting example where we're seeing the average post-test scores by age and module. The chart shows the Module 1 results on the left, Module 2 in the middle, and Module 3 on the right. The slicing here is seen by the fact that the results are split by the age category of the participants. This is a concrete example of slicing learning data by module and age, a demographic variable. Here's another example showing participants' perceived importance of place-based learning by the frequency of tool use. We can see clearly labeled X and Y axes. However, layered on top of that are two categories, agree or strongly agree. This indicates whether the participants agreed or strongly agreed that place-based learning is important. This is an example of slicing attitudinal data, sense of importance, by tool use and level of agreement. We also want to remind you to explicitly refer to tables and figures in your narrative write-up. The ways you can do that are super simple. Here's an example. As shown in Table 1, half of the participants felt the videos were too long. In this example, there's a very clear reference in the sentence itself to Table 1. Now another way to do that is to put the reference to Table 1 at the end of the sentence in a parenthetical statement. Here's what that would look like. 50% of the participants felt the videos were too long. And then we have an opening parenthesis, see table one, followed by a closing parenthesis. This is two different ways of accomplishing the same thing. We also want to remind you that per APA style, you need to one, spell out numbers greater than 10, and two, do the math for your readers by including percentages in your sentences. So let's take a look at a few examples. In terms of viewing the videos, eight participants, or 53%, reported watching the videos multiple times. In this example, the number eight is spelled out because it is less than 10. And eight out of 15 participants is 53%. Providing both the raw count, eight, and the percent, 53%, makes it easy for readers. Now, here's another example. For the instructional videos, 13 participants, or 87%, reported watching all three videos in each module. In this instance, the number 13 is written as a number because it's greater than 10. If you wanted to start that sentence with a number, then you would need to spell out 13 participants because it's starting the sentence. 
And of course, in both of these examples, the percentage, 87%, is provided in parentheses. As a final reminder, we want to emphasize how to report averages with their standard deviations. Let's take a look at an example. The average confidence rating for all 15 participants after the instruction was 4.13. Standard deviation equals 0.92. Now, it's important that there's a leading zero on the standard deviation, because in theory, standard deviations can be greater than one. That's why you include that leading zero. The other thing to notice here is that both the average, 4.13, and the standard deviation, 0.92, are using the same number of decimal places. Typically, you'll want to report two decimal places for the types of data that we're working with in LTEX 690. Sometimes you'll want to compare two averages in a single sentence. So how do you do that? Well, here's an example. The five participants in the first year of teaching reported higher average confidence ratings compared to the other 10 participants. 4.25 standard deviation of 0.57 versus 3.89 standard deviation 1.13. This is how we can compare averages between subgroups of participants. So there you have it, folks. A few reminders about writing about learning and attitudinal data. Thanks for watching.